Hi, Misha here, and it's time for another collection video. Though this one's going to be a little different, because it only has five members in it. But we will take a look at Chinese Type 56 guns, chambered for 762 by 39 all of them. Of course, these are Type 56 carbines. SKS's and these are derivatives based on the Type 56 assault rifle kind of known as the AKS or, or 56S as a semi-auto and the only reason I have five of these is, is I've kind of gone more as a collector in the quality over quantity with Chinese guns there are so many flavors there are, are entire collectors who dedicate to Chinese and that's just not my taste but I wanted to have representative pieces of the military guns they were actually used by the Chinese People's Liberation Army say hi hobo and so these are the ones I've picked so in the video, I'll talk about the military service, and I will also talk about some of the Simato import history, and explain why these are the guns out of all the ones that have been through my hands that I have decided to, uh, to keep, at least until something even better even comes along. That's typically how I do with Chinese, I don't really add, it's just when a nicer example comes, I'll sell off the previous one. So with that, let's talk about the Chinese SKS. These two versions here. And their history. The Type 56 Carbine. China's designation for the Soviet SKS 1945 because China adopted the SKS in 1956. And really, China, if not the first, was one of the first countries outside of the Soviet Union to manufacture the SKS. They were interested early on. Mao had just won the revolution. And so in the mid-50s, relations were good. They had previously manufactured the Russian Tokarev TT-33 pistol. It was first the Type 51 later the Type 54, and the Russian Mosin Nagant M44 Carbine as the Type 53. But there was a bolt action. With the SKS, they went to a self-loading rifle, chambered for the 7.62x39 M43 cartridge. And while this was quickly becoming dated, to Russia and many other European nations, China thought it would be ideal for the large army that it planned and uh, police forces, reserves, and for export. So in 1956, production began at the Xinhua, or Xingxi arsenal. They used the factory code 26. And originally, these were not only close copies of a late Soviet pattern, they were even built using Soviet parts. But soon, China would switch to using all domestic parts, and they would start making changes to the design. So these are my two examples. They kind of represent some of the most common traits of a Chinese Type 56 SKS carbine. The most noticeable difference is, of course, the stock. While the majority of Chinese guns have traditional wood, a large number, especially those kind of destined for export, 
we're given this fiberglass furniture, often called Bakelite, although it's really not. And the theory is that these were meant for more jungle environments for wood, maybe not the best thing. What I think is interesting about this, this the sling it comes with has these um, rings, kind of the pigtails for the metal instead of the leather, which makes a lot of sense for a jungle environment. Another large change would be, of course, with the bayonet. Originally, the Chinese guns would have the blade type, just as a Soviet. Although, keep in mind, the first year or so of Russian production would also have this pig sticker, which um, China would, would go to with their SKS around 1965. They would also move the rear sling swivel several times. Early on, it would be on the bottom, then they would go to the side, and then for some, some, at least some later guns, they would go back to the bottom. Still had a trap door in the stock for the cleaning kit, including on the synthetic stock model here. And still had a blued finish to the metal. And still had a 20 and a half inch barrel. As well as a fixed 10 round magazine intended to be topped off with stripper clips. Those changes were kind of functional, but many others were to speed up, streamline for mass production. Like the Soviets, the original style would have a lightning cut on the bolt carrier. They would uh, do away with that. There would also be a lightning cut on the rear sight. They would do away with that. Similarly, they would go away from having lightning cuts on the bayonet lug housing here. And the gas block would change a few times, as it did on the uh, Russian SKS as well. And they would go from a milled trigger guard here to a stamped and welded trigger guard as seen here and a few other little economies like that but these would not affect the functionality of the rifle production would continue at factory 26 for the Chinese People's Liberation Army and for export customers such as Vietnam well through the 60s and into the 1970s. But then other factories started producing these smaller factories and in smaller numbers, but producing them nonetheless. It seems like main production ended in 1980 but they might still make some SKSs using small batch runs and refurbishing old ones. Another change that would be hard to see here, but you can kind of have the telltale where the barrel meets the receiver. The earlier ones in the majority of 56s were screwed into the receiver. But late in production, they took kind of the AKM style and started pressing and pinning the barrels in. Again, to save manufacturing time and to make head spacing a little easier. And some very late production guns would even go away from the machine to the milled receiver to a stamped one. But it does not seem likely that these were used by the Chinese army because they were so late in production. And these would be popular in China, kind of used as a de facto DMR, 
also with police and kind of second line military units and they would produce millions of these no one knows how many maybe not even china but some estimate as many as 10 million and they started exporting many to the usa in the 80s of course the 94 ban interrupted these but in the 21st century some 56s have come in from third-party countries such as albania so while this was a secondary gun to the AK types, it was actually very important in China and very well suited to them. And really had more of an impact there than it would in Russia or any other European nation, to be honest. Before we move on to the AKs, the reason I have these two, no more, no less, is there are good representations of the variations. You know, we have blade bayonet, we have the spiker pig sticker, we have synthetic stock, we have wood. This one has the side sling swivel, this one has the bottom. This one has early features like the machined trigger guard, this one has later like the stamped. This one even has a screwed in barrel and this one has a pressed and pinned in. It wouldn't be bad to have a stamped receiver Chinese SKS, but those seem to be pretty uncommon. And I have had a couple of the magazine-fed ones, but since they're not really military and they're only so-so on the reliability department, I've kind of chosen just to sell them off or trade them off over time. I'm pretty content with these two. The SKS, while I really like it, is not my favorite gun, so I don't feel a need to have half a dozen but I'm very happy with these two I especially like the synthetic stock one I think it's just a cool variation and I like the pig tail sling it comes with which is kind of different and with that let's move along to the other type 56 you know at first it might seem a little odd or confusing that the Kalashnikov, the AK, AK-47, Type 3, whatever you'd like to call it, was also named the Type 56 in China. But really it makes sense. The SKS was the Type 56 carbine, as in self-loading carbine, and the AK was the Type 56 rifle, as in assault rifle or select fire rifle, Kind of like how the U.S. had the M1 Garand and M1 Carbine. So I have my uh, spiker out here. Chinese mag in it. And I have my Russian again because early on, China produced exact copies of the AK Type 3. In fact, in 1956, through the first couple of years, the guns, much like with the SKS production line, were assembled using Russian parts, using Russian supervision to help. And these would come out of Factory 66. There's some arguments as to what this code actually applies to, which factory, and many sources seem to indicate it's actually a shortened version of another factory but even there they disagree anyway that's where they started so early on they were milled receiver guns standard wood furniture blued finish 16 and a quarter inch barrel type 1 bayonet lug under the front sight base threaded except they would have chinese uh, chinese markings one of the earliest changes, Chinese mag voucher, by the way, that China went to around 1960, the Russian front sight base was open topped, which is mostly what you see on AKs. Well, the Chinese went to an enclosed front sight base, excuse me, front sight 
protector with a hole in the top for uh, adjustment. Interestingly, Finland with their Valmet also went to an enclosed, as did, of course, Israel with the Galil. So that was a relatively early change. Another change was adding the Spiker bayonet. The SKSs came around 1965. Well, the AK would get it around 1966. But not all, of course. They would continue to produce some, mainly for export, to be fair, with the Type 1 lug. Also, some, many produced for the Chinese domestic use, would not have a threaded barrel. Instead, they would just have a bare muzzle. But again, for export, they would usually thread them for versatility's sake. And up until this point, many things are the same. However, relations between Russia and China had broken down. It was a bit of a time between 61 and 62. There was a, a split, and then there was some gestures to Khrushchev and Russia to open up relations again a year or two later, but this thawing was very short-lived. What this meant for the Type 56, China was not given access to the newer AKM plans, which Russia adopted in 1959. So, as they moved forward, they did more and more of their own thing. One of the earliest things they did, they went from the old school screw-in barrel, as seen on the original Russian, to the more efficient press and pin-in barrel from the AKM. And then, beginning around 1967, they would go from the milled receiver, machined receiver, to a stamped receiver. But this would be a unique stamped receiver. It would not be a copy of the AKM type. The rivet patterns would be, uh, would be different. And the front trunnion would be different. It would still have a magwell dimple. But it would actually be 1.5 millimeter instead of 1 millimeter. So they basically took the milled AK Type 3 and put their own homegrown stamped receiver on it. That's why the Chinese gun retains a lot of original features, including the medium heavy profile barrel, the sling swivel on the uh, gas block, the uh, smooth sided handguard, usually the original 800 meter rear sight, And often the wood pistol grip. Now they would go to a single top tang held on buttstock. However, it would still have more of a downward sweep than a typical AKM. And this is really when China started to differentiate itself from Russia and the rest of the pack. By the Mid and late 60s, Factory 66 was far from the only manufacturer. You had other codes such as 56, 386, 416, and even more. And probably some we're not even aware of today. The switchover from milled receiver, machined receiver, to stamped, was not instant. In fact, all factories had not transitioned over until around 1970. But by this time, at least for the People's Liberation Army, the stamped receiver was becoming the standard. Interestingly, a lot of the older milled guns were sent to Vietnam during this time period, which is why a lot of U.S. GIs, when they think of the Type 56, they think of the milled version. That's because they were kind of cast-offs from the PLA. And while they were going to the newer stamped gun, it was uh, lighter. It had a few modernizations. For example, they moved the rear sling swivel to the bottom of the stock here. Usually kept the wood grip. 
Original Chinese mags were much like Russian, but soon they would go to the style with the smooth back rib, which is a little more ergonomic, easier to get in and out of a pouch. They simplified the ribbing, and they were a little faster to produce. They still had the ported gas tube, though. And even though the spiker bayonet was a standard, it's kind of neat. It's, uh, it's actually pretty quite detachable. You can remove it if not needed, because it does add some weight. So yeah, from the 70s onward, stamped were the game. And these were still the frontline guns for China. But as they were able to produce more than enough for their needs, they started actively trying to export them to, I would say, other friendly communist nations, but let's be honest, it was China. They were exporting them to anyone who would buy. <laughs> and uh, became quite a popular frontline gun. Although, again, the SKS was often used by more second-line troops. The reason I have this one here, well, that was always the one I thought if I was going to have just one Chinese AK, this would be it. Not maybe specifically this gun, but this configuration. Fixed wood stock and spike bayonet. This, to me, is just the quintessential type 56. And this is my second or third one that I've owned. This one came from a friend who bought it new in the late 80s. So I know it's history and yeah, this would and this would be the last one I would sell of them because it is just their distinctive rifle. And this this style isn't super hard to find. I have had the legends before, but the fact that they never really did a uh, spike bayonet legend is kind of a turn off to me. And also the fact that when they were doing the legends they were going more for a Russian clone than a Chinese Type 56 clone is not exactly what I wanted. And I had plenty of other mill guns. So in the end I decided to let the legend go to someone else who wanted it and would appreciate it more. And I'm very content with this as my standard Chinese AK. And with that, let's look at some of the variants. To go along with the fixed stocked Type 56, China, pretty much from the outset, adopted an underfolding version known in the military as the Type 56-1, typically written 56-1 uppercase I, so Roman numeral. And of course, when it, well, I should say, when production switched from the machined receiver to the stamped, it too went to a stamped receiver. Interestingly, there's a bit of an argument as to if militaries actually used an underfolding spike bayonet slash underfolding stock version. It doesn't seem like the Chinese military did. Although, perhaps some full autos were made and sold for export. It really isn't a great idea because the underfolding bayonet and underfolding stock A. interfere with each other and B. really make it heavy. <laughs> so typically, the 56-1s took a blade bayonet. Some might take a Type 1 Others might take a Type 2, so an AKM style. Some other AKM features crept into the design, such as the slant muzzle brake. But many original features remained, like the ported gas tube. And the military select fire guns did not get the rate reducer out of battery safety mechanism, as seen with the AKM and wood pistol grips persisted for a long time. They did also simplify their magazines further, like this one here. If I can get it out. <laughs> Maybe. 
or hurt my hand. Okay. There we go. Am I going to a kind of an all stamp design without the top piece? Just uh, stamping it in. Still keeping the lack of a spine. And there are lots of magazine variations if you really want to break it down. And up here I have my Polish AKMS underfolder, which is a dead ringer for Russian. It has the AKMS stock, which is stamped and riveted. It locks on both left and right side. And it has a very straight angle analogous to the AKM stock. However, the 56-1 kept the more downward sweep of the original AK Type 3 and only locked on the left side. As you can see here, there's no lock, just a pivot here. And it's more just straight. It is stamped metal, but it doesn't have the rivets and stuff. It's just a different pattern. And they continue to use the straight, non-palm swell handguards. Depending on the factory, bulk carriers could either be in the white or blued. But typically the metal finish would still remain blued. Here we are, folded up. Notice the uh, rear here. The single locking, I mean the double locking on the AKMS, and the rivet pattern. The Chinese, it's pretty different. We have two small rivets, very close together. It's kind of a rear block. And that's, that's it, really. On a thinner receiver, they probably couldn't get away with this, but since this is a 1.5 millimeter Generally speaking, they could. The 56 one was popular with uh, Chinese and many export users. Well, that needed an underfolding stock gun. It has all the benefits and the tractions you would expect. Here is a typical Chinese chest rig that you're probably familiar with. With lots of pockets, holds three mags. You actually do see quite a few underfolders, both military and semi-autos like these. But notice they did not adopt a lot of AKM features like the rib top cover, the relocation of the sling swivel, just really a lot of stuff. It is at its core a type three a mill gun however by the 70s the uh, chinese military is really needing something new there was some changeover around 73 the uh kind of brand name norinko would soon appear standing for chinese north industry corporation or company depending on which source you ask and more effort were put into exporting these guns. And work began on trying to update and modernize the design, both to be cheaper and more competitive on the global market. The pouch in between them is one of the many Chinese styles. This one holds five mags. Doesn't really have much in the way of pouches Besides it, <laughs> it's neat though. Got the little closure and then a second one inside. Yeah. So this one here is kind of interesting. Underfolding stocks are not my favorite. Oh, let me get this. Fold it out. There we go. But I like the Chinese because it is a unique pattern. It's kind of a hybrid between the original milled 
AK Type 3, AKS Type 3 I should say, and the letter is stamped AKMS. And um, I thought the story of this one being a cotton customs gun was uh, was neat. And really the only artifact from that, since it has a working stock and a removable muzzle device, is that it doesn't really have a... Well, I would say it doesn't have a working lug. Actually, this front one still works fine as a Type 1 lug. But back here, it's machined down. And since it's not a true pre-ban pre-ban, of course, the price on it was much less. In fact, it cost me about what a nice Mac 90 would at the time. And I thought, eh, for that, why not? Adds to the collection. It's a good shooter. And since the 56-1 was such a popular gun within the Chinese military and for export, having a semi-auto example, sure, why not? I have had a couple of double folders, as they're called, ones with the spike bayonet come in. They just, I know to a lot of people they're very neat, and that's, I appreciate that. To me, they're not. They're very gadgety. The, the two elements get in the way of each other, and they're very heavy. I like the fact that a simple underfoot like this is relatively light and can be made very compact. I just don't feel like I need a spiker on this one when I've got a spiker right over here. So, personal opinion gives a little different flavor, a little different style, and lots of companies have uh, imported the Chinese underfolder. This one is from Style, I believe. Might be CSI, but I think it's style. Either way, it came my way. I wasn't really looking for it. It's a good opportunity. Picked it up a few years ago. Why not? And again, I find the Cotton Custom story of the 156S-1 just very interesting. And now, my most recent acquisition. And it's history. And this is what... Designers at Norinco or what have you came up with the Type 56-2. Again, the Rome, the uh, select fires would be written Roman numeral two. This is really the same gun. They really had gone away from the uh, spike bayonet at this point either using a type 1 or a type 2 AKM style they went to a new synthetic furniture often referred to as Bakelite a couple of different pistol grip styles have been seen but this seems to be the more common on select fire guns and of course we go to this new style of side folding stock. It doesn't have a trunnion sticking out in the back, although it does have a bit of a locking latch here. And you can just pull it, and then when it's in the back it locks in position very securely with a checkered button on top for release. So actually quite uh, quite easy to use. It has just a simple metal butt plate, and under these Bakelite looking panels, there is a storage spot for a cleaning kit. And they did make kind of matching mags that are often referred to as Bakelite, but truth is they're more of a, more, a modern polymer. They're Mark 66. They seem mostly to be for export, especially to the U.S., and unfortunately I don't have any at the moment, so we'll have to make do with the Tula. But it uh, shows you the thing. The problem with the 56-2 is that it took them a very long time to develop this model. Uh, China had been going through a lot of social upheaval in the early and mid 70s so this wasn't really ready until 1980 by which time the AK was looking pretty obsolete 
As a result, for frontline service, the Army ended up going with the Type 81, which is an entirely different gun. So, the 56-2 was primarily targeted towards the export market, where it found greater success. That said, even within China, a few military units acquired it, more law enforcement did, and some border guard patrols acquired it. Because it is more compact with the more modern furniture, and has some appeal. It's also worth pointing out that the 56 wasn't quite done. There would be a carbine version, known as the QBZ 56, created mainly for the Navy because the Type 81 rifle didn't carbine well. So that would be one final Chinese military version. And then, of course, in more recent years, even the Type 81 itself has been replaced, at least in part, by the QBC-95 bullpup. So, you know, time moves on. A number of foreign entities, militaries, police, and otherwise, were actually interested in the 56-2, so much so that the model is a pretty common sight in the, in the world today. Many of these were sold to the Middle East. Sri Lanka went to these. Pakistan acquired some, and maybe most interestingly, Finland purchased around 100,000 of these in the early to mid-1990s to supplement their vomets. They weren't really planning to issue them on a day-to-day -day basis. They just wanted to put them in storage to have stockpiles in case Russia ever got up to anything. They weren't sure the disillusionment of the Soviet Union and whatnot. They acquired, like I said, about 100,000 of these. They also acquired about 100,000 East German MPI, KMS, and KM models. The Type 56 also kind of has the distinction of being used on both sides of more than a few conflicts. For example, when China and Vietnam were having a disagreement, both sides had the Type 56. Also, Afghanistan, many Type 56s would be there, and they'd be picked up by Russians who would use them against the Mujahideen. And both sides during the Iraq Iran War in the 1980s would have some Type 56s, meaning that this rifle, depending on you know, 56, 56, 1, 56, 2, would more than once go up against itself, which is not surprising because China built probably even more of these than it did SKSs. Estimates are between 10 and 15 million. Even though kind of main production ended in the 1980s, there were at least one or two factories still building them today, although it looks like the days are numbered. It looks like they're kind of producing these using the parts they have, and then they'll roll up the production line because they're a couple of generations removed. And the 56-2 is kind of the final major version designed and used for military customers and others needing select fire. So with that, what about semi-autos in the USA? Unlike the 56S-1, I've actually been looking for a 56S-2 for several years. But a couple of things were always in my mind. One, I knew what I wanted and what I was willing to pay, and therefore had a max price thing. And I really wanted a Norinco, not a... Polytech. The Polytechs are more common, but they're not quite as close to military as the Norinkos. Now this one here is a B-West import, which the B-West imports are fine, and it's kind of a hybrid. 
It mostly has Norinco features, like the standard safety, the standard uh, mag catch, and most importantly to me, the curved pistol grip, which I just think is interesting. But it doesn't have the AKM bayonet lug up here. Instead, it does have the Type 1 style. That's the only thing that's a little disappointing about it. I would have preferred the uh, Type 2. But since it is technically an AKS, not a 56S-2, that's what it is. But it came in at the price I was willing to pay. It's in good shape. And otherwise, aside from the bandit lug, it's exactly what I've been looking for. The magazines are kind of a funny story. A year or two ago, I got a pouch full. A pouch like this full, so five, or maybe six of the 66 marked mags and I knew as soon as I sold them because I didn't have the gun at the time I would actually stumble into one of these and that's pretty much exactly what happened so now I need to find at least two of the 66 matching mags but that's alright speaking of pouches here's the chest rig laid out it has three large pockets for mags and then on each side it has two smaller pockets in mine I've got a mag loader, stripper clips and uh, a couple of cleaning kit things and a spare muzzle device. They're neat and they're a very famous Chinese pouch. Yeah, I'm very pleased with this. Um, like I said, uh, 910, it's exactly what I was looking for with only the bayonet lug. Not quite what I was hoping, but the price was in line and I actually got it thanks to a subscriber on here. So he knows who he is, and I'm appreciative. I didn't get it directly from him, but he clued me into a place that uh, that did have it. And the reason I wanted a 56S-2 when there were so many other variants out there, there's actually two. One of them, the stock and furniture is just unique. There's nothing else like it. When I was laying them out, you know, I compared these two with a Russian and a Polish analog. I couldn't think of any other gun from another AK manufacturer. Hey, look, another cat. Say hi, cat. And it had this style of folding stock. Nothing even really close. And another... It was a military gun. A lot of the imports we got in the 80s were just semi-autos made for the U.S. market. Even if they were based on military stuff, they were kind of just, yeah. But these three are all very close to Chinese or other military issue guns. Of course, the Spiker is standard. Underfold, they're pretty standard. And the Dash 2... I really wanted it primarily because of its connection with Finland. The fact that so many are using them in Finland. It's known as the RK-56TP there. But it's also used by other militaries, as I pointed out. And some were in service in China, even if it was more of a police border guard thing. This is kind of the ultimate culmination of the military Type 56. Because after that, they just kind of went to other things. And yeah, that's kind of why these are the three AKs I've picked. If money were no object, sure, I would have an 84, an 86. But, you know, with the price of pre-bands, even Mac 90s, what it is today, you know, one really needs to be selective about what they pick up. And with that, let's talk about pre-bands and Mac 90s in more detail. And we'll try to make a bit of a slideshow for you here while I ramble on. So, what about Chinese AKs and SKSs in the USA? Well, prior to the 1980s, not much. There were no semi-auto Chinese AKs here, period. The only ones here were bringbacks from Vietnam, which, as you can imagine, were select fire. Many not exactly above board. However, the 1968 amnesty 
did allow some guys who originally brought them back illicitly to register them and get them on the uh, the list legally which is good so there are a handful of true bring back guns that are on the paper and uh, you can have register whatever also some brought back were demilled cut and uh, basically redone as semi-autos to some extent and that's another way on the other hand of course an SKS a Type 56 or otherwise could be brought back from Vietnam no no legal issues there at that time so we did get a handful of Chinese SKS's that came back from the war but for real mass import we would have to wait to the 1980s now some people believe that Golden State Armory or Golden State Arms was the first. This is definitively not true. And it's easily proven. Clayco was the first. According to public records, the company was established, at least in the form we know it as, in Kansas, in September of 1982. Golden State was not established as a company until two years later in 1984. The problem is quite simple. There was another Golden State <clears throat> Arms or Armory. Sorry, it's late and I'm not going to look. Way back in the 1960s, it's quite famous for doing BM-59s and other Italian guns. And also conversions of infields. However, that wasn't Golden State Armory distributing or distributors. The one that brought in a case was actually G-S-A-D. And that D is the important letter there. So Golden State distributors that brought in AKs didn't really get going. Probably didn't have its first batch of AKs on the market until 1985. Still pretty early. But Clayco definitely had them on the market by 1984 based on ads that we have. And uh, several sources say... By 1983, they were available. So, 83, 84, yeah. Before that, the only AKs really were Valmets and some early Mahdi's imported from Egypt by Steyr, which, which is very early on. So, with that, what about the versions and uh, variants? We would be here all night if I tried to list all the different ones. But you can pretty well break them down between early and late. Early would be pre-1986 and late would be 86 through 89, the ban. Early on, you had, of course, Clayco. And yes, uh, Golden State was an early one. Another early one was uh, B West. And there were some early 1985, including mine, dated KFS guns. In other words, kind of pre-poly tech. The first guns to come in were essentially sold all under the Norinco brand name. So let's start there. The difference between Norinco and Polytech. Norinco, as I said earlier, is the China North Industries Corporation or company, it's kind of said both ways. Anyway, you get it. It's a combination of words, which is in conglomeration. It's not a factory. It's just a company that exported and dealt with companies in the USA. Polytech, likewise, was a company that exported. Sometimes they even export from the same factory. For example, the factory coded as 386. But Polytechs were near exclusively, with just a tiny number of exceptions, imported by Kang's Firearms, KFS. So Kang's pretty much equals Polytech. And they were established to deliver 
some uh, slightly higher quality product, at least what they thought, with some refinements. For example, spring-loaded firing pins, magazines with chrome-plated followers, uh, maybe a higher degree of, of wood, uh, higher polish blowing, and also they were kind of an early uh, tactical setter in that they went to a bit of an extended shelf on the safety and oftentimes would use extended mag catches. Little things like that. On the other hand, oftentimes the Norinco guns were closer to military type 56 types, which is generally why I prefer the Norinco's versus the Polytex. Not because I think Norinco's are better, but because I think they are more authentic to military. But as it happens, and this is just personal experience, it does seem like the Norinco bluing, while it's not as shiny and, and polished, is maybe a little more durable. Um, Polytex, I think probably because of all the shine and whatnot, tend to show fingerprints and even have surface rust a little easier. It's just kind of what I've run across, but you know, your mileage will definitely vary. <sighs> so early on, Chinese AKs were generally named and role marked AKS, with the S standing for either Sporter or Semi-Auto. This would include the Klaikos. Also, early guns, because again, these were very early AKs, like the Klaikos, had all these wonderful warnings on the uh, top cover about modifying it. You can also see this on other imports from that era, such as the IMI Uzi Model A and Model B. People think that this whole gun control thing is a recent phenomenon. Oh no, it dates back well to the 80s and even 70s. So early imports, while they have much to recommend them, do have a bunch of lawyer speak on the um, dust cover, which is kind of bleh. Now, the guns that Clayco and some other early importers brought in were kind of, at the time, the current Type 56 analog. And by that I mean no spike bayonet. They had the more modern Type 1 or Type 2 bayonet lugs. And they had the more modern synthetic furniture, which is quite interesting. While some Clayco's can have wood, many have what we call Bakelite. And even neater, it can be the reddish color in several shades. It can be pretty much black. And it can be what we call green, which is really more of a black with a green undertone. Kind of like, you know, Russian plum is kind of... Anyway, yeah, yeah, some neat variations there. And most of these would have the, uh, the slant type muzzle device. As far as I know, none of the 80s AKs from China had a bare muzzle. They all were threaded 14 by 1 with some maybe minor exceptions here and there, but you don't see many of that. Next up, the, uh, the synthetic ones, and this is as more importers would get into the game, you would get the Spiker, which you saw mine. Now mine's an early Polytech uh, type, but before that I had an early B West type. Both were dated 1985 on the Trunnion for whatever that's worth, and marked AKS. These were probably the closest to a just Chinese military type 56. Spike bayonet, which, like I said, is detachable, which is pretty neat. With the slab side, wood handguards, wood pistol grip. And the bolt carrier could be blued, but often was white. And there would also be underfolding versions with the spike bayonet. But... It's not really clear if the Chinese military ever used these or not, at least in numbers. There might be the odd picture here or there, but it doesn't seem like they used them a lot. Most would have the slant compensator, but some, especially the, the Polytech types, the KFS types, would have the muzzle nut. That, that was kind of their preference. And that's another thing to point out. The Chinese companies... Norinco, Polytech, what have you, would pretty much configure them however the U.S. importer ordered them. They were very happy to do that. 
So you'll see different muzzle devices. You'll see different types of stock. You'll see some stocks that have more of a reddish hue. And you'll see stocks that have more of a brown hue and some that are even more of the blonde. And typically the bolt carrier being in the white or blued is an artifact of which factory it came out of. For example, 386 versus 416. But plenty of factory 66 guns have also turned up over the years. So by the 1985-96 period, this whole, hey, let's bring in some auto Chinese AKs thing was really gaining steam. While the Steyr Mahdi's weren't really doing that great, the Chinese were, because the Chinese were offering in more variety, and, more importantly, they were cheaper. Also, they consistently shipped with a bunch of goodies. Bayonet, three mags, cleaning kit. The styres were a little more iffy. Some did, some didn't. But at this time, that's all we really have in the pre-ban era. And that's about all we would get, except for the Kastner Hungarian guns from FEG. But very few of those came in, and very few of the Mahdi's came in. But the technical term for how many Chinese guns came in between 83 and 89 is a metric shit ton. And they would. There would be many, many importers and many variants. I can't even list all the importers, and I don't even know if anyone knows all of them for sure. You had the big ones, like I said, B-West, KFS... Sile out of New York, S-I-L-E, was another big one. Clayco kept on for a bit. Uh, Golden State. You also had some that might be better recognized through other imports later, like Dominion Investment Group, DIG, who was an early importer of Bulgarian AKs in the 1990s. But then you had these little ones. They were just like were little one-off mom-and-pop outfits. They brought over a few hundred or a few thousand guns. Again, the China was willing to sell to anyone who ordered. Uh, one that comes to mind you don't see too often is BCI. I think they were out of Tennessee or Kentucky. And you had the, so was it Arms Co., I believe, was another one. Oh, there was, again, there's just so many. You can look them up online. And most of them just brought over Norinco, pretty much your standard gun. And around this time, 86, 87, they would stop using the name AKS as much and go to 56S. Obviously, short for Type 56, so semi auto, sporter, what have you. Now, there would be the standard Type 56S, which typically had wood furniture and took either a Type 1 or more frequently a Type 2 bayonet, so AKM. That was your bog standard gun, still in 762 by 39 You would have the 56S-1, which was an underfolder, with a, still again with the stamped receiver. And it typically again took a Type 1 or Type 2 bayonet. Then you had the 56S-2, which is the side folder you saw, and it had the synthetic furniture, again with either Type 1 or Type 2 lug. There's only two known legitimate spiker folders in the USA, which seem to basically just be prototypes. So for all intents and purposes, they were all detaching bayonet guns. And the line would just progress on from there. You had longer barrel versions. For example, one company had been imported uh, the 56S-3, which was a fixed stock version of the 56S-2. So pretty similar to the early Clayco's, at least in a lot of ways. You had the match guns, which had the 20-inch barrel. Many would refer to them as RPKs. They're, they're not. They're just essentially long-barreled. 56s, stamped receiver. Some would have the, the Chinese tubular bipod and, and flash hider. Others would not. 
Mini would be sold with the 75 round backloading drum, it's true. So, kind of like the Valmet M78, called a RPK, but really not. Oh, by the way, most of them would have kind of a club foot stock thing too, but not all. And then, of course, you would have the one a lot of you are familiar with, the Polytech Legend, as it's known. Officially roll marked as AK-47S. This would be the first milled receiver gun. Most came in as a fixed stock milled gun, although there were underfolding, and there were even some match target ones that were supposedly accurized with the longer barrel. However, there was not a legend spiker folding bayonet. All of them had the detachable Type 1 bayonet, the original AK Type 3 style that hooked under the front side base. For whatever reason, KFS Kings preferred the older style bayonet lug. You don't see many, if, all, if any at all, KFS guns with the Type 2, the AKM style lug. Now, the Legend is interesting. Over in China, they had not made a milled AK for the military since around 1970. Was like, like I said earlier, some factories switching over even years before that. So that milled receiver was made for the U.S. market. And it was not made to be a clone, a copy of the Chinese Type 56. It was actually made to be a clone, a copy of the Russian AK Type 3. This is evidenced by the fact that it had more Russian style markings on the rear sight and a lot of them came in with furniture kind of stained to be more of a Russian red color. And of course they had Russian features like the open-eared front sight base and they took the Russian type bayonet. Again, Kings really preferred that and what have you. But I've done a comparison video in the past pointing out how the legend is different from a Russian. And you can check that out for a lot of details, but I will point out things like it has a cast front sight base, not machined. It does not have the vent cuts in the upper handguard. And it has a wire recoil guide rod instead of the early machine type that Russians would have used. And one that always stuck out to me, the trigger guard has three rivets instead of five on a Russian. And attached to it, it is very clearly a stamped mag catch, not the early Russian style. So you can definitely uh, tell them if you look. But keep in mind, in the 80s, while this was kind of considered a premium AK, it was still Chinese, meaning... It only cost 100 150 bucks more than your typical stamped Type 56. Now, a lot of people will tell you they, that they picked up a Chinese AK for 100 bucks or 150 in the day. That's one of two things. It's either them mixing up SKS, which could be had for that money back then. Again, remember, they're both Type 56s, and they both shoot 762 by 39 Or... They're just bullshitting you. They're just full of it. I'm sorry, but the Chinese guns, while they were affordable, were never retail, brand new, even dealer cost brand new, 100 bucks. About the cheapest I've ever seen was there was a flyer or two when they went on sale. Stamp guns were about 175 dealer. But there was more of a markup back then. So even if the dealer was being generous, they would have been on the shelf for 250 maybe 300 Meaning the legends typically were on shelves for 400 to 600 But also keep in mind, that was 1980s dollars. You can use the online economy calculator. You'll see that that was, um, that was more like 650 to $800, maybe even verging on 900 in 2020. Still a very good deal. But honestly, kind of right in there with where you see a Wasser or as a Stava ZPAP today. Eh, just food for thought. Although, to be fair, they did come with a lot of uh, accessories back then. So, yeah, the, the Legend. We, we have done multiple videos on them. 
And while I respect them, I don't really feel that it's all that close to a Russian AK Type 3. If it was still a thousand bucks or even fifteen hundred, I would still own one. But considering all the differences and the fact that they're three grand and up now, I, I just let it go. The truth of the matter is, as I pointed out in other videos, I enjoy my other mill guns more when it comes to shooting. But yeah, you can check that out for some other videos that we've done. So I'm not knocking the gun, but it has definitely received a good dose of, uh, of overhyping, in my humble opinion. While the majority were in 762 by 39 quite a large number of Chinese AKs were imported, chambered for 223, 5.56 NATO. This would be the 84S series. Most were your typical wood-stocked guns, so they looked just like a 56S, except they had a birdcage flash adder, and they took their own proprietary 223 steel magazines. There would also be an 84S-1 underfolder, and there would be a version with synthetic furniture, and there might have even been a few side folders, but I can't remember, sorry. It's never been a gun that's super interested me. Another one that's never really been up my alley, but I think is neat, just not my taste, is the 86S, which is the bullpup. It is just a 56S chassis put into a bullpup stock. It has a foregrip that can fold, kind of borrowed from the Steyrog. It has its own unique flash hider, and it has its own unique horrendous trigger pull. They're neat, but yeah, it, it's yeah. I mean, they might have influenced later bullpups like the QBZ95 a little bit, but not really. Uh, it, it it was just kind of a fun commercial thing. One of the rarest pre-band Chinese imports was the 88S, and that was chambered for 545 by 39. And this is a very interesting gun. Only 50 are known to have come in, which would, to me, sound like a pre-import sample batch. Now, based on the year model 88, that tells me they probably were brought in right before the ban. So that could be the reason. But it also could be just the caliber. 545 was a very new caliber in the 1980s anywhere. And that would have been really the only gun chambered for that round in the USA at the time. So where would you get ammo unless it was imported from China? For that matter, magazines. And it's interesting this came from China because China never adopted 5.45 by 39. Although they did make the Type 88 for export customers. And many consider it a clone of the AK-74, but it really wasn't. It really was just a Type 56 rechambered for 545, and with a copy of the Russian big old 74 muzzle brake. Nevertheless, this is historic for being the first of its kind in the USA. I also find it interesting that North Korea adopted a 545 gun known as the Type 88, and it's known that China provided military assistance and support. I have to wonder if there's some kind of connection there. But again, story for another day. Just thought I would um, point that out. And with that, I do apologize if I left out your favorite import. I just tried to go through them, kind of giving you an idea of what we got. You know, fixed stock, folders, under folder, side folder, synthetic furniture, black, Bakelite. There's even an odd version imported by Kang's that had like a Galil type side folding stock. I guess that was maybe the, the, the Polytech version of the... Yeah, I don't know. It was an interesting thing. It seems to have only really been made for America. And you would have different versions of like the 56S-2, for example. You'd have a Polytech version and an Orinco version. A little differences and things, like I said... Um, the pistol grips another is a big one to point out. The the polytech version had more what's called as a nineteen eleven looking grip, more squared off and straight. The Norinko version 
has the grip like is on mine, which is often referred to as kind of the VZ58 style grip. It's a little smaller and more swept back. Yeah, just, you know, things like that. Even more annoying on the 223-556 market, Polytech and Norinco, at least some different versions, there were two different patterns of Chinese 223 magazine, which is exceedingly frustrating as time goes on for us. Now, of course, all of these Chinese 56 guns would be new-built semi-autos because of the ATF. Now, there would be a number of authentic Chinese SKSs brought over by the many times the same company. For example, CSI brought over a lot of SKSs, although they did AKs as well. Some would be newly built, or at least newly assembled from existing parts. These are often referred to as commercial guns. But many would be military guns, either refurbished or even sometimes just in, just in configuration brought over. There were also some mag-fed versions. Long ago we did a video on the Navy Arms magazine-fed SKS. It's a little carbine with a 16-inch barrel. That's a neat gun if you haven't seen that video. You might enjoy checking it out. There were also full-sized, so 20-inch SKSs that took AK mags, commonly known as the SKSD. These don't seem to be military guns, any of them. They seem to be have done for the U.S. market, even though some of them were created by converting existing SKSs, again, while others were uh, maybe purpose-built. A little vague there, and it's, it's kind of hard to know. So things were really sparking 1987, 1988. We had a lot of importers. They were all bringing them in big numbers. And China was producing these in a lot of factories. And since the military was no longer really buying the 56, they, they had plenty of capacity. But all good things come to an end. In March of 1989... An executive order came out of the White House that was signed off on by George H. Bush, Sr., that banned the importation of assault rifles, if you will, you know, military feature style rifles. Now, this was an executive order, and they got away with it because it was considered a clarification, an addendum to the 1968. Gun Control Act, which was passed by Congress. And they couched this ban in amongst many details of a gun control, excuse me, a uh, drug control order. So, you know, war on drugs, tough on drugs. You remember how strong that was during the Reagan era? That's how it really slipped by. And this is where imported guns were banned by feature. You couldn't have pistol grips, folding, collapsing stocks, bayonet lugs, threaded barrels, flash hiders. It didn't really say anything about magazines, interestingly. But it addressed all the other little fun features. It also banned many guns just outright by name, including the Steyr Aug and Chinese guns and blah, 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 blah. And this would lead to the 90s era. Now, a few websites credit this ban with Clinton mixing up it with the 94 assault weapons ban, which was a domestic thing. No, no, no. This happened in 1989. And this is where we get a series of guns that were so-called caught in customs. My underfolder, 56S-1, is actually a 156S-1. That gun, along with many fixed stalkers, were caught in customs and were released, but had very light modifications to make them compliant with the new uh, executive order, the new ban. At that time, they really didn't know what it meant and how secure it was. It ended up leading to a kind of an amnesty grace period, because a lot of these guns came in with uh, thumbhole stocks quickly installed and muzzle devices quickly tack welded on and bayonet lugs quickly ground off. But at that time, it was thought, well, once we bring them in, we can restore them, pull off the doofy stock, and, and, and you know, untack weld the, the muzzle device. Yeah, the whole video we've done on that, you can check out the things. But by 1990, the full force of the post-ban took effect. But Chinese guns were really selling well. 
And so neither China nor the importers here wanted to give up on them. So a special version to comply with the ban was created. It would go by a few names, namely MAC-90 or NHM-90. You'd see some of the old importers, you'd see some new ones, and essentially these guns were brought in with thumbhole stocks. They would have the bayonet lug removed. Early ones would just have a muzzle nut tack welded on, a threaded barrel, but very soon they would start turning the threads off the barrel altogether. And one of the most baffling things to me, they removed the cleaning rod brackets on most. Uh, apparently cleaning rods were evil. The idea was to make the gun look more sportery, less military. They still had double stack magwells, although they did, although they did start shipping them with 10 or even 5 round mags, but they could take a 30. Obviously they would quit shipping them with bayonets because yeah, you don't really have a lug to put it on. And these would just flood the market between late 90 and early 94. This would be the time when AK, uh, Chinese AKs would come in in numbers. This would also be the time when quality control would start to slip. They'd already been banned once, so they just wanted to get as many over as they could. And I think just they didn't care as much. So there starts to be more issues with these. Most of them purely cosmetic, like loose furniture or spots in the bluing, canted sights, rough triggers... But some did come in mechanically pretty iffy, as if they even run. You would also get some that had so-called slant cut or slant back receivers, which couldn't just take a standard buttstock. This wasn't so much done to comply with any law as it was to use up existing receivers originally intended for underfolding stocks. If you look at the end of my underfolding stock gun, you'll see how it's slant and kind of tapers in towards the pistol grip base. That's kind of what they were. There was also one batch of milled guns, milled receiver guns, imported in 1993. And all of these will be slant cut. But it doesn't really matter because, hey, milled gun, pretty cool. But aside from the Polytechs that were imported in the 80s, it's about the only milled Chinese you'll get. And they would do 223 variants, as well as, of course, the 760 by 39 although obviously the, the variety would drastically decrease because of having to have thumbhole stocks and having to have no cool features. Most of them just, you know, blued finish, wood furniture. A few different factory symbols would show up, but yeah. This, too, would pass because in April of 1994, all Chinese rifled boar guns were banned, were sanctioned. Now, this was under Clinton, and this was in response to some international shenanigans dealing with ports and trafficking, and I don't want to get into it now. You can look it up if you want. But effectively, in April of 94, Chinese guns were halted. Only shotguns, smooth bores, have continued to be allowed in. All pistols and rifled rifles were banned, including SKSs. There was no CNR exemption this time. It also banned the, the Tokarevs. And many guns this time were caught in customs again, but unfortunately they did not quite get away as easy as the other guns in 89. Many of these, after languishing in dispute for a couple of years, were released to their importers, to their owners, but had to have their receivers cut up. And then, so they had a parts kit. And then one of the uh, most famous, infamous guns was the MISR-90, which was an Egyptian receiver mutt with a Chinese parts kit on it. It was not good, mainly because Sentry Arms had the assembly job on it, but also it just wasn't good because the specs are all different. That was bad, even worse in the 90s, and one that really tarnished the name. Now, like I said earlier, B-West was not only an importer in the 80s, it was an early importer. 
and they brought over a number of interesting guns, uh, spikers, side folders, under folders, and the B-West guns, which were Nurmiko brand, were no different, no better, no worse than anything else. But in the 90s, they decided to try building guns using Chinese parts kits from DMO guns on their own receivers. Uh, this was bad. Uh, their receivers were terrible. They did not heat treat them, at least properly. And it almost seems like they just cold blew them. Whatever bluing they used or prep agent beforehand, the bluing was very thin, would rub off, and was prone to rusting. Even if it didn't, again, the heat treating was off, typically the receivers would warp, the pivot pins would egg out. Very bad stuff, and it gave the B-West Chinese guns a pretty bad rap. The thing is, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. The true imports will say China on them. They'll say B-West, of course, but China. The U.S. receivers will say USA. And they won't say China. So if you're looking at one, just be mindful. The B-West guns, at most, the U.S. ones, are at most worth it for the parts kit. And most people agree just not to trust the receiver. This might be behaving a little overcautious, but better safe than sorry. And enough issues have been reported that it really does seem to be a, a true issue, not just one of those internet things. And you know me, I'm the first to kind of dismiss internet rumors. But in this instance, it seems true. So, where does that leave us after 1994? Well, we could not get anything rifled out of China for a long time. But, beginning in the 21st century, a nice thing started to happen. If a gun is in another country long enough, some people say 20 years, some people say 25, it doesn't matter, basically generations of time worth, as far as the government's concerned, as far as the law is concerned, it's no longer from its original country, i.e. China. So we started to see SKSs imported some years ago that were authentic Chinese type 56 carbines, but they came out of other nations, probably most famously Albania. Also, in the last few years, more and more Chinese type 56 dash one, so underfolding AK parts kits have come around. And, uh, of course, these have to be imported with the receiver cut up, and after 2005, the barrel had to be cut up. But you still have a parts kit, therefore spare parts for your existing gun, which is nice, or something to build a Chinese gun with here in the USA, on a U.S. receiver and a U.S. barrel. It is worth keeping in mind, though, that you will need a specific Chinese Type 56 receiver and barrel, at least if you want to do the build right, and not have something that comes off looking like a Misser 90, which you really don't want. Probably most famously, James River Armory, JRA, has built them in recent years for Classic, but they're not the only one. Other, other companies, like, say, Two Rivers, have built them, and they seem to be of better quality at Two Rivers, but... I think Atlantic might have done a, a run as well, but I may be mistaken on that. I've not really been too interested since there are so many Chinese imports. A lot of pre-bands, which are, as you see, and even more Mac 90 style post-bands. How many? Well, we don't know for sure, but Chinese sources have estimated perhaps as many as a million that's one million Chinese AK-type rifles. So whenever someone says how rare they are, give it some perspective. For example, there are only about 350,000 Colt SP-1 rifles and carbines. And you see SP-1s quite a few places. And you know, they, yeah, there's uh, maybe three times as many Chinese AKs here. Again, counting post and pre ban Now, some are truly rare, like the 88S. But if you're just talking about a bog-standard, fixed-stock wood gun, or 
underfolding gun. No, those are imported in very large numbers. Even the Polytech Legend was actually imported in very large numbers, comparatively speaking. So don't really be taken in by the rarity of Chinese guns. The reason they go for so much money and can be hard to find is that they're under extreme demand and have been for the last few years. It's interesting because they, they used to be kind of considered um, junk and now they're gold and did a video on that last year. And they can be fun deband projects for like Mac 90s but just be sure where you know what you're getting yourself into because uh, you might find you ended up putting as much money trying to deband a postband as you could have found a preband for. And with so many prebands out there, there are deals to be found. They're not all two, three thousand dollar up, even today. And I'm not talking about ripping someone off who doesn't know what they have. But some people just don't care about AKs. Some people just want to move them. With so many out there, you'll find a seller willing to kind of negotiate on the price. Or maybe you can trade one and do well. That's another, uh, another decent option. But up until recently, the Chinese AK was the most common semi-auto in the USA. I think by now the Romanian AK has probably eclipsed it. But for a long time, it was the cheapest, most affordable AK you could get. And was imported for well over uh, 10 years. And if you talk about pre-band AKs, as I've outlined, it's really your only option. I mean, at least in numbers. Yeah, Hungarian and Egyptian guns are here, but in tiny numbers compared to the Chinese. And it's debatable if a Valmet or a Galil is really an AK AK. There were no pre-band Bulgarian, Romanian, Polish, Hungarian were, again, small numbers. They didn't do like an AMD 65 back then. And there were no pre-band Russians. So yeah, there you go. A bit of a uh, narrative rundown. And we have, as I've said on and off, many videos addressing this. So if you're interested, you can check those out for more information. Well, we made it through another collection video, even if this one was a little, uh, little different than the previous ones. I know that Chinese guns are very popular and there's still continuing to be a lot of interest in the SKS's with recent imports and of course AK's. So even if I couldn't do a 12, 13 gun layout for you, I at least wanted to be thorough. And again, for more details on individual topics, You can check out some of our past videos. It's funny, for quite a long time I was resistant to getting into Chinese AKs altogether. I was really focused on the European guns. But as I kind of ran out of interesting options there, and as these guns kind of came to me, I slowly changed my mind. My first uh, spiker was because a friend just needed it to sell it. And again, the sender folder was just a good opportunity online. And the uh, side folder here was thanks to help from a subscriber here who knew of a gun shop needing to, to move one. And uh, yeah, both of these. In fact, this gun, this SKS came from the same owner that this gun come, came from. And this gun here came from the same owner who owned my previous Spiker. Which was uh, B West, like uh, this gun. So I don't know why I find either, in my own experience here, I tend to find either B West, Narinkos, or Kang's Polytechs. That is just what I've found over the years. And of course, a host of Mac 90s. The only other one that's kind of tempted me to keep are the uh, 20 inch barrel ones that have the tubular bipod. I had a really nice post band one come in that, that nevertheless still had the right stock on it and uh, had the bipod the only thing it didn't have it didn't have the right birdcage flash rider but as it so happened at the time i had a spare call it an 80 type 87 whatever you want to call it lmg type flash rider so i put it on there and that was uh, that was kind of tempting to keep but since those weren't 
really, really 100% RPKs and weren't really used by the Chinese military much. I taught myself out of it. Again, you have to be choosy, and when you sell guns for a living, you really can't keep everything. Or you're, you're never going to get anywhere in life, and I still have bills to pay, and I have plenty of RPKs. But other than that, I haven't really been tempted by many other models. Like the 84, the 223 is neat, but it just looks like the others, except it takes expensive and hard-to-find mags. The 86 bullpup is neat, but I'm just not a big fan of bullpups, especially half-assed AK conversions. And, uh, as I said before, the Legend, nice gun, but not quite my speed. I prefer, say, my Hungarian SLR 100H or my SSR 99P, which is a Polish build, or the, um, the Russian PLO build you saw at the beginning of the video that's on a, uh, firing line receiver so i've just found other mills that are more my speed and honestly a lot cheaper because the legends especially have gone bananas the stamped guns you can usually find for 200 to 2500 with just a little bit of looking sometimes the underfolders are even 1800 still but uh the milled guns good grief they've uh, they've gone crazy and to be fair these uh these here the side folders tend to be a little high too but they're out there. So, um, what Chinese guns do you own? What are your favorites? Are there any that don't really interest you? I think the only one I might like to have would be an all Bakelite furniture, black or black green from Clayco. That would, might be kind of neat. So analogous to a Type 56-3. Although I don't know if the Chinese military ever used them. It seems like when other militaries were picking these up, they really preferred the folders, which makes sense by the standards of the 1980s. really does. So yeah, I'd love to hear your opinions and thoughts. And if you could, as always, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. And with that, we'll end another long collection video. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.